Story 3 opens on a playtime with Andy as he sees it. A blockbuster good time reintroducing us to the cast of Woody, Jesse, the Potato Heads Mr. and Mrs., Slinky Dog, Rex, Bullseye, Ham, and Buzz Lightyear, the slimmed down cast of the toy crew who we'll be focusing on for this adventure. We see a brief home video montage of Andy when we knew him as a child. This is an image of me watching all these films before we uh, see him in the modern day. Growing up, he's 17 now and off to college in a matter of days. The same crew hasn't been played with in a long time feeling unvalued and are trying to accept the reality that they'll be transitioning to storage in the attic life now that Andy is moving to college. Andy decides to take Woody to college with him instead and while trying to take the rest of the toys to the attic in a trash bag, his mum accidentally thinks it's garbage for real and the rest of the toys believe Andy decided to throw them away. Instead of accepting their fate and not believing Woody's point that they were going to the attic, they hop in a donation box to go to Sunnyside Daycare. In the box is one of Molly's toys, a Barbie who was also donated. Once there, everything actually seems pretty good. A new start while they'll be played with by a rotating roster of kids who will never leave them. A crew of toys at Sunnyside, including a strawberry scented teddy bear named Lotso and a Ken doll, who immediately gets along with Barbie, show them around the place. Things seem great, but while the majority of the crew are excited to start their new life, Woody remains loyal to Andy and leaves alone. He's picked up by another kid, Bonnie, on the way out of Sunnyside. The first playtime in the Caterpillar room is a nightmare. The young Younger kids are as rough as guts on the toys, and obviously they'd prefer to be with the older children. Buzz sets off to speak with Lotso to request a transfer, where it's revealed that Sunnyside is run by basically a gang like a prison. Lotso and Ken force new toys into the Caterpillar room, and those who survive get to stick around. To keep him in line, Buzz is reset to his demo factory settings, and Lotso uses him and the rest of his loyal toys to lock up the rest of the crew and force them to cooperate. They're trapped in Sunnyside. Woody has a great playtime with Bonnie and her crew of toys, but when it's revealed that he can came from Sunnyside, the rest of Bonnie's crew tell him about its true nature and of Lotso's backstory. He was replaced by his owner Daisy and turned sour on the idea of a toy's life cycle at all, adopting this nihilistic worldview that they're all doomed. He took over Sunnyside and rigged the system and Woody plans to help get everybody out. He gets back to Sunnyside and with the rest of the help of the toys plans a prison break. The prison break includes disabling a monkey security guard, getting Buzz back to the way he was by way of accidentally putting him on Spanish settings, and Mr. Potato Head using his pieces inside other materials and making their way across the playground to the garbage chute. They're ultimately caught, but Woody unveils his knowledge of Lotso's former owner, Daisy. Ken changes his tune to plead for a better sunny side, and it looks for a moment like the toys might get out alive. Woody, however, is caught by Lotso and dragged into a dumpster, and the entire crew of toys, save Barbie and Ken, find themselves on the way to the landfill. Buzz is finally back to his old self, but the crew are eventually pushed into the automated system of the landfill designed to shred and then burn trash. While Buzz and Woody work to save Lotso from this fate, Lotso ultimately betrays them in return and doesn't push a fail-safe button to stop the automatic conveyor from forcing the toys into the incinerator. Out of options, the toys seem to accept their fate, hold hands as a family, and face their final moments with dignity before they are saved by three Pizza Planet aliens operating a claw and fishing them out. The toys return to Andy's house, clean themselves up, and it looks like things might be okay, but Woody seems to realize that the toys sticking together might be more important than him staying with Andy, so he quickly arranges for Andy to donate the whole lot of them to Bonnie. Andy does so, and while initially hesitant to give Woody over as well, eventually does. He has one last playtime with his toys in their new home. Bonnie promises to take good care of them, and he thanks them and drives away. So my section on the good dinosaur was quite long, blame some overgrown sense of needing to champion it online as someone who actually likes it for once, but I hope that this probably shorter section on Toy Story 3 doesn't feel perfunctory by comparison. I think this is a brilliant movie. It's just a little bit harder to write interesting stuff and give my own perspective on a film that basically everybody understands and likes, you know? I don't have to feign some complex to write about it or get super teary-eyed, we all fucking get it. I don't need to get emotional in my video, the footage is going to do that for me. <laughs> I don't want to make the mistake of feeling as though Toy Story 3 kind of goes without saying, but it kind of does, right? <laughs> you don't need to dig too much to get to it. All the good stuff is pretty plainly observable. Of the conversations I've had with folks about Pixar films, this is the one that I, I think got its point across to the most number of people the most successfully. It's difficult to know where to start from there. I've heard of more people who haven't seen it than I expected, but mostly all those who have pretty much get it. They enjoyed it, they remember it, they understood it, and they walked 
walked away with usually a pretty significant or sharp memory of something from the movie. I'm some kind of insane person who likes this studio and cares about it way more than I should, so when I have chats with people about Pixar and Toy Story 3 comes up, it's usually far more vivid stuff and that stands out to me. There's a lot to be said for how successfully 3 managed to walk this line of entertainment, comedy and nostalgia along with a solid emotional point and viewing experience that remains memorable and effective. It's a really hard trick to nail, there's a lot riding on this movie, it's in a very strange position. As a capstone to a trilogy, it's very hard to deliver on the hype and emotional threads like this whilst offering a unique experience, spicing in some references and fan service to make it special, but also get a really great clarity on your theme. It threads this needle of being entertaining and emotional without really hiding much. It's a very straight up movie with a straight up viewpoint and a very straight up bucket load of good times. I feel it pretty much conveys everything it wants to quite clearly. As a film dealing with some pretty intense emotions at times, but doing so within a family film framework, I think Toy Story 3 might be one of the least subtle movies they've made, but that doesn't mean it isn't smart. Or effective for that matter. My god is this film smart. It's like Back to the Future in how whole it feels. Just a great deal of everything that you want and wrapping it up in a package that basically anybody can appreciate. It's a fantastic stepping stone into conversations rooted in emotion I feel for anybody of any age or any education. And as ever, Toy Story being the Swiss army knife of appeal that it is, the ageless quality of it comes from it being able to be something to all people. I was about 14 when it released. I saw it uh, with my whole family in the cinemas. I was a few years shy of the end of high school demographic that Andy is in, but I've still been able to appreciate this film as almost all of the people who could find something in it so far. Toy Story 3 within Pixar's filmography was released just before Cars 2. So in hindsight, personally, I consider it to carry this weight and has this aura of finality and importance around it, not just for Toy Story, but for Pixar. And there is no precedent for it in Western animation in 2010. The way that feels to me, the way I can describe it, like for a very long time, each time I watched this would feel like the first time again. It's the final flourish on an entire decade of smash hits and immediately following this they released their worst movie. There was not a single film released by Pixar in the decade leading up to this that was not all sorts of beloved and Toy Story 3 remains like a capstone on that run. As things shook out it was followed by three films I found more underwhelming so personally I think it was another five years after this before they made anything close to it. There is no playbook to follow for it and even fewer people asking Pixar to do anything but take the simplest route and just do another toy adventure when this comes out. It feels irreplaceable now but really even though 11 years had passed between the movies all they needed to do was just another toy adventure. Incredibles 2 had been ages since the first one and time hadn't passed in that film's world. Same for Finding Dory. The sense of real time passing between the movies is a unique choice, much less the emotional weight that the film aims for with that. Andy doesn't need to grow up. That's not on the bingo card unless you put it there. Evidence for that? Well, Toy Story 3 originally wasn't going to be made by Pixar at all. Now, Disney haven't always owned Pixar, but as per their initial distribution deal, Disney owned the rights to Pixar's characters and could produce any sequel that they wanted to. This included if they wanted to hand those duties to other studios, which they did, along with proposed sequels to Monsters Inc. and Finding Nemo, when negotiations between Disney and Pixar to renew their deal broke down in around 2006. Disney handed Toy Story 3, Monsters Inc., Lost in Scaradice, and Finding Nemo 2 to what was called Circle 7 Animation, which, looking back, appears to have been something of a bargaining chip situation to get Pixar along side, forcefully taking the rights to their characters and doing whatever they wanted. But for a little while it looked as though they would simply look to a different distributor and Disney would make these movies by themselves. All of this was conducted by then Disney CEO Michael Eisner, who while having presided over the Disney renaissance in the 90s, had seen the company fail to keep up with their own new IPs alongside what Pixar had been creating. When Eisner was succeeded by Bob Iger, Iger has often told the story of why he returned to the negotiation table at Pixar when he realized at a Disneyland parade that all of the new characters there were not Disney's, they were Pixar's. At the time, Pixar was owned by Steve Jobs and eventually Disney purchased Pixar outright and Circle 7 animations were shut down with its workers either going to Pixar or to Walt Disney Animation Studios proper, which as part of the buyout would also put the Pixar chiefs John Lasseter and Edwin Catmull as the heads of Disney Animation at, as well. Simplified, 
Disney animation was flailing, so Disney kind of tried to take the characters and brand recognition from Pixar to help themselves along when it looked like they might move to a different distributor. Disney ended up buying Pixar completely, and instead of taking their characters, they took the people who'd made Pixar a success and had them help the Disney ship get right a little bit. So for a short time, just like with Toy Story 2, Toy Story 3 was basically strong-armed by Disney, and even early script treatments had been written with wildly different stories. This included stuff like toy recalls for the entire Buzz Lightyear line and the crew being flown to Taiwan to see Buzz get repaired. Scripts were written for that story. None of this early work was looked at by the folks at Pixar who took the reins to the project after they'd been bought in this all stock deal. Lasseter likely had his hands full basically remodeling Disney's entire other studio so Lee Uncritch stepped into the director's chair for Toy Story 3. The team started fresh and tried to find a way to make the Toy Story 3 they needed to make instead of the one they simply had to. The whole business side of Disney and Pixar is quite complicated and ugly and for many I'm sure kind of rains on the parade a little bit. For as casual as I'm trying to make this series none of these movies are pure and I'm not deluded about that at all. I do plan on reading more about this once I finish this series. I'd like to feel more informed about these intricacies and the, how they've affected the studio's history and they'll most likely re-inform my feelings again entirely which I might make a video on in a year or two. I'm gonna watch that Bob Iger masterclass at some point with a big bag of salt. I will read Edwin Catmull's book. I will read further into how they handled the strikes last year. Uh, badly? Disney are bad? Obviously I love these movies and think there's a great deal of artistry present but greed and artistry are not mutually exclusive so there's a lot of dicey extra stuff here that is really interesting to read about but if anything reading about these people and the situations behind the films always helps me get a better sense of the humanity in them and I admire these movies even more for what they're able to achieve out of these kinds of difficult circumstances. I do think it's interesting to know that Toy Story 3 was apparently somewhat close to not only being an entirely different movie but possibly being made by a like a different animation studio which no longer exists and that the choice to make it kind of wasn't in Pixar's hands at all. The triumph is hiding that, is pulling what became an urgent important film from that fiscal responsibility. That's the kind of artistic integrity that I find speaks to me, not just refusing to make the thing you've been told to but to take the situation and find the angle that transforms it into a crucial piece of work. What we get out of that for Toy Story 3 is a film that far exceeds that conception where the time in between the films gave rides to its stage where we weren't just doing another toy adventure we were grappling with major emotional aspects of aged up characters huge emotional deltas about growing up and moving on born from this uncertainty the monster of temperance and value and who knows maybe Pixar wanted to emotionally seal off their series so that it couldn't be touched again without major financial repercussions we see how that's gone Toy Story 3 as it exists today retains a particular particular set of crowns for the studio as being easily their most scary film but also perhaps their only entry into the growing genre of event films. Walking into Toy Story 3 felt the same as walking into Avengers Endgame 10 years later, No Way Home, walking into Avatar 2. Brimming with fan service but also just anticipation and genuine remixes and updates on the tried and true Toy Story moments that felt like a great escalation but also capturing of what makes the series so enduring yet shines with the glamour still entirely its own. There's an element of indulgence but it doesn't overshadow the actual story here. Since it's built not only on the two prior films but also the time in between and the love which filled it, this cannot be replicated very often. It's an opportunity you kind of need to set out to forge for yourself but can't look as though you're doing that. Like you build the option to maybe someday be able to make this kind of movie to tell this kind of story that you know will be seen by millions of people and Toy Story 3 took that opportunity, one there wasn't a blueprint for, and went with it to places that remain startlingly daring. From the very opening, the authenticity of that playtime rockets me right back to childhood. Every line is a zinger, every character getting a save the day moment when all seems lost, somehow finding yet more and more reasons for everything to be a near miss or a quick escape or a big deal. You can tell parents probably really watched over their children for this part. It's such an explosive, emotive way to open the film that rings very true to at least how I played with my toys. Everyone is a hero, everything is desperate, the action never ends, everyone's surviving in possible odds by the skin of their teeth and last minute brainwaves. From there Toy Story 3 is a film uniquely positioned to do away with character introductions, really the emphasis is being placed on Andy and how things have changed. Really since he was more peripheral in the prior films and animating humans is now something Pixar had a much better grasp on, he has a larger role here than ever before. Displaying the smaller crew of toys kind of mourning the those they've lost including Bo Peep and the lost time begins punching
punctuating the film with emotional moments this early, and it really sets the stakes and signposts this tonal change. Toy Story 3 employs this persistent sense of danger, of entrapment, abandonment, even mortality, which gives it this weighty undertone that it frankly needs to work pretty hard to offset, going to more outlandish places with its comedy than usual to compensate. The chic Le Frig dress up model sequence is an example of that, but this undertone sees a great many of the thematics that have been laid down in the previous films being realized on a scale and with a potency here that is very impressive. The fear of becoming lost, of moving on, of being left behind is now no longer a distant bridge to cross once we get there, it's staring the toys in the face and must be dealt with. When you finally have to face the thing that you've been scared of and it's right in front of you, what do you do? It's an investigation of that mortal instinct, of the immediate choices you make when staring down the barrel of a fundamental life change. You can hear the group's hysteria, them fraying and emotional, a little tired of waiting and of Woody's sunny outlook all the time. For this opening, he hits a similar spot that Joey does in Inside Out a little, ignoring and downplaying the emotions around him to reassure everyone when that probably isn't helping. Woody was scared of being replaced in Toy Story 1, scared of Andy growing up or being broken in Toy Story 2, and in ruminating again on these types of themes, there is a little bit of a risk, a risk of it feeling like repetition, but from moving them from perspective problems to the immediate issue that the toys are dealing with, the sequence of the stories and the deep internal conflicts felt throughout all of Toy Story, I think become beautifully consistent. They're simply shown in a new way each time. As I said for Toy Story 4, there's something very true to life to getting caught on the same troubles again and again in different ways. I think especially considering the length of time the series has been created over, Pixar keeping their eye on the prize of the series core questions is hard to do. Coming back to these same themes again and again is actually the, like, maintains a consistency. I'd be very surprised if there isn't some kind of internal Toy Story Bible around the themes and values, honestly. The toys are always going to be concerned about their value in a world in which their function is to be objects in the eyes of their masters. There's a very long line of questions about how merchandising interacts with this for the property, on how Toy Story could be seen as some kind of guilt trip or plea to always hold onto your possessions forever, but I don't give it much credence. The stories are pretty clearly using toy problems as a means to speak about human issues and insecurity. The villain and location shift also helps ease this possible theme repetition as well. Sid's house and Sunnyside Daycare were both places the toys tried to escape from, the prison break is somewhat familiar, but we're accomplishing dual purposes here. Things like moving day, a high story breakout plan, being played with in a rough way, it's all somewhat treaded territory, but it works from a nostalgia angle to remind people what they connected with in the other stories, but shifts it into this new area that means those same devices are still effective on this larger scale. Firstly is making the end antagonists of this story, toys, whereas in both prior films that wasn't as much the case. Sid's toys were actually really nice, Stinky Pete was kind of a twist, and humans were seen as these forces of nature, so being more upfront about the toys within Sunnyside being the real opposition, the film channels its adversity through a honestly more aggressive place because like the, the malcontent within the film is coming from somewhere deliberate. Additionally, the locations alter the feeling here as well. When I was a kid, I was fascinated by like a pizza arcade and an airport like, oh, these are places that I don't go every day. And you'd visit those in Toy Story 1 and 2. But somewhere a kid does go every day, like a daycare, doesn't quite appeal to the same fantastical sensibility. Strangely, the unsettling thing is to see toys situated somewhere they're supposed to be, but don't want to. The environment feels more grown up that way. The story of a toy running after a moving van feels imaginative and fun in a childlike way, but being trapped inside a daycare, especially at night and in the way it's conveyed, feels that touch more actual, like it's been researched and observed by parents, the obstacles the toys need to contend with feel less soft. So while there's a subject matter overlap, it's a remix and revisitation within an atmosphere that feels more adult throughout. To this, the generally far scarier vibe I think is suited really well. I think the first step to ensuring this happens is that sometimes flies under the radar, but significant once I noticed it, there aren't any songs in the middle at any point, Randy Newman or otherwise. A couple of snippets of Gary Wright or Sheik as mentioned, but there's a persistent resistance to montage or moments of comfort throughout the film like both Toy Story 1 and 2 had. The playtime is this explosive opening, but past that point, the film kind of holds off and restrains itself from that familiar hug or even comforting air to breathe at many, many points. The tour of Sunnyside is lovely, but is obviously used to instill a false sense of security. Even Woody's playtime with Bonnie comes with this side note of unease given the other goings on in the film. This outward spookiness during the prison break is a natural escalation of this tone, but also of a lot of other subtler expository work done within Sunnyside. The idea of a prison break from Sunnyside Daycare has always been a really
really favorite concept of mine from Pixar. I think it's fucking genius. In keeping with how films from them can be like tried and true film genres within an animation form, this is just such a classic place to go. Just like aging up the characters and the thematic punch up, the concept work for this film I think is deliriously strong. And just when I noticed, oh, it's a prison break movie, I, I just fell in love with this movie even more. But it's also an idea that arises really naturally within the story. There's these feelings of warmth and friendship and promise being used against you, a new beginning that gives way to this uneasiness, stealth, danger, until we start using legitimate horror devices. The security systems that they'll eventually need to contend with is introduced slowly, but it also feels completely believable, like it's a daycare, of course you can't have kids getting out. It's not some obvious setup to me, it's subtle and it builds over time. Andy's mom is buzzed in through the main door, so the first thing you kind of know about the daycare is that it's pretty secure. It's giving you a good idea of what the breakout scene will be like before you get to it by introducing the forces rallied against the crew. This moment actually as well where Andy's mom knows Bonnie's mom is to set up the very end of the film by establishing that the families are familiar with each other. Andy isn't some random guy rocking up to a stranger's house at the end of the film, which I think is a, a neat solution. These slow hints in how secure the daycare is are spaced out at the same rate as the ensemble positioning, with the large group scenes giving everybody a line, giving everybody the feeling of working together, which subtly preps you for their teamwork later on, and also hints at the adversary team led by Lotso and Ken as well. It's a group versus a group within this larger space that you're being shown, so you get ample time to understand everything without it really being all that obvious. By the time the sun has set, we end up with a big chunk of the film basically being a heist or a breakout movie that is playing by rules that we don't know we've already been shown, and we start seeing not only revisitations to classic Toy Story fare like Slinky Dog being an absolute goat, but venturing into territory of classically frightening filmmaking. String stings, jump scares, this, this deadly quiet. It hits this spot for me I remember as a kid of seeming to pull from this genre that I knew was well established, but I hadn't seen all that much of. Obviously there are some horror tropes like Big Baby turning around and stalking closer to Woody hiding undercover. It's like the Nazgul's over the tree in um, Fellowship of the Ring. But the tone of it feels unexpected and it maintains this unique feeling within Pixar's movies because they've never come back to this. This is definitely an aspect of personal taste coming in where I just like a little more danger in these movies. I just complimented The Good Dinosaur on being a film that doesn't pull its punches or do the same thing with Incredibles 2 on its thematics but for Toy Story 3, at least for me, it always hit this scary spot in a very particular way that is loud and confident and defines the film a great deal. It's not just emotional in a make you cry way, it's got that edge of tension and actual scares which helps those moments of love feel more earned and all the sharper. For this aspect alone of being their scariest film, even well before the incinerator, I'd say Toy Story 3 more than earns a high place of reverence on this alone. The thing is that it manages this overarching tension during this prison break set piece whilst each individual story is actually always quite funny and inventive. You've got Potato Head's concept being pushed with him inside of a tortilla, Barbie interrogating Ken, eventually fixing Buzz, Woody and Slink, disabling security, getting the keys. Each individual branch presents its own jokes and fun within this larger mood of teamwork and spookiness which manages to pull off some very extravagant jokes without the situation feeling any less dangerous somehow. That's really impressive to me. This is probably the most ensemble based Toy Story film with a focus on Woody of course, but it feels far more like a group affair than any of the others. This is helped by Lotso having his own crew, again, the presence of Barbie and Ken basically having their own storyline, Jesse and Potato Heads being pretty essential to the action as well, and with the particular element of Mrs. Potato Heads missing eye giving the toys a view into Andy's room when separated from him, everybody's kind of playing a part. It makes sense that it would be a more group affair. It's dealing with a group of toys being left behind and you get a great look at their individual emotional response to that. This is all tricky from a visual standpoint though to use these older characters since the aesthetic of this film is modeled on two movies that were built years prior and the tech advancements in between are quite significant. The majority of your cast are characters built and designed sometimes 15 years prior and with whom the audience is very familiar. There would have been an ability to absolutely leave the first two in the dust and totally update, overturn and abandon that style but apparently Pixar held themselves back from doing that very deliberately. While with new toys like Lotso 
also being a fuzzy bear, like textures and weights that you can't create back in the day. The older toys from the original films were deliberately compromised so as not to be able to physically do things they couldn't do in the prior movies. Riz Lightyear's eyebrows here had like three controls in Toy Story 1 and 2. So instead of going full hog this time and adding in like 20 controls, they kept the amount of them lower so it wouldn't feel like his expressions were jarringly different from the first two movies. I think that's nailed. They all feel like exactly the same characters. I'm supposing this would extend to the look of the whole movie, the desire to use the new tech without feeling a world away from Toy Stories 1 and 2. Toy Story 4 obviously doesn't make the same choice, possibly to separate itself from the trilogy really distinctly. It's shot in a widescreen ratio, going for a very different style, but it's possible some of what we see in 4 might have been an option in 3 that just wasn't taken. The new toy additions feel consistent with these same choices. Barbie and Ken are animated in a similarly stilted way to the Barbies from Toy Story 2, what with their open hands and squeaky joints. While obviously looking very new and very special for the time, humans especially are far more advanced. The aspect ratio of 3 is the same as 2 and 1. The photographical style preserves the same sense of scale as a major draw too, which I particularly enjoy. This movie feels really, really huge. That first playtime in the Caterpillar room is so vivid and massive. The land feel is gargantuan. The ultra close, ultra wide lenses, the way the daycare rooms are often shot very close to the toys or really wide from up high to preserve that feeling of size from any angle. The way color saturation and bloom lighting is used in the film works very hard to convey different feelings of safety or perception at any point of the of the film and dissimilar from a movie like up where the color shifts in this really natural way i think toy story 3 plays it a lot more extreme with saturation or hues changing in sometimes the same environments in one shot if you look for it it seems to happen pretty often when things are a little pale it can feel a little like disconcerting but then when woody steps onto the roof of sunnyside it's all pumped colors again when buzz starts noticing other toys hiding in the caterpillar room the colors are still like quite warm but as soon as the door bus opens somebody flicks on a fluorescent light with a very well placed sound cue as well and things just get colder without losing any of their vibrance. It gives this feeling of exposure, danger and having nowhere to hide on top of all the other photography tricks. This sequence is so effective man, Jesse's hair getting dunked in paint hurts me every single time. It's awful stuff. Great job. Two other visual moments I love, Buzz's laser leaving a little trace circle on the plastic tub, and when Potato Head's tortilla is shredded and he looks over toward the cucumbers, he pats his other half to get its attention like it's a different character and not also him. I just really like that touch. It's hard to speak to how perfect Barbie and Ken are here, and I think kind of remain within this film. I was interested to see if it would hold up after the Barbie movie last year, and for sure it plays into a romance dynamic that is deliberately subverted in Barbie, but I think there's still a great deal of individuality to them here in this this film. And save for one very special joke, Ken and Barbie are the comic heart of the film. Michael Keaton as this actual replica of animal loving Ken from the 80s with a lot of replicated Barbie fashion is just hysterical. The man's comedic talent just shines through so well. Jodie Benson was also brought back from her time as tour guide Barbie as great shape Barbie in this and does a great job punching up this character too to have a lot more range. They're both such great additions to the cast. They go over so well and there's so many fantastic jokes with them both, especially in their ability to be really cheesy and ham up the emotion to this melodramatic degree. It's a very wise thing to add in here. Jesse's right! Authority should derive from the consent of the governed, not from the threat of force. Hold on. Let me get that one more time. Jesse's right! Laws are threats made by the dominant socioeconomic ethnic group in a given nation. The one special joke that overshadows them, however, is Spanish Buzz, which might be in the running for Pixar's best joke. It's so unexpected and stuck with, it's really followed through with on every angle. The execution here is darling. The voice, the dancing, the subtitles, which for some reason aren't showing up in my footage here, the entirely changed mannerisms. There might have been a temptation to have him keep switching between different languages, but to just just pick one and have it completely alter the character for minutes of the film, creating gold everywhere he goes, is just a lot of fun. It makes the best of the opportunity and is a marvelous way to add in a continual lightening of the mood during the prison break sequence, the right spice of bizarre to lift it up. As I said, it's a very outlandish joke. It seems a bit more extreme than Pixar usually go, but given that it's minutes away from everyone holding hands thinking they're about to die, yeah, sure, have a Spanish guy do a dance for a bit. Lotso as an 
an antagonist is quite interesting, representing this kind of natural end to the fear that Woody has had this whole series. Woody having been persistently afraid of being replaced or lost or letting Andy go, eventually finds his solution with sticking with the other toys, but Lotso took this other route and got nihilistic, and since he seems to derive his sense of value entirely from Daisy, when she replaced him his center was completely displaced. Instead of turning to Big Baby and Chuckles and seeing them as his family, he began to turn his rage outward, speaking and behaving as though toys are trash, made to be thrown away, there is no point in living, all that stuff, just unable to pull himself out of this doom-laden mindset where he kind of can't understand the point of why he exists. He's been replaced and has started acting on the fear that Woody has, but as a belief and a worldview, that Daisy never cared for him at all. Therefore, humans don't love toys, so he's gonna get his at the expense of everyone else who still has this ingrained belief that humans care at all, which he seems to feel a need to stamp out of people. Toys are used by kids before throwing them away, according to him, so he's built a place where toys use kids in return, and he tries to beat that into everyone who gets to stick around. To face the prospect of a new beginning and like a new home and a new start, but it's occupied by a character who represents this pessimistic end of a toy's journey and is able to, to represent such a natural graduation of the series core tension while in this one location is very, very organic like smart work. The idea of toys having to deal with toy problems like this is interesting since like being ignored and thrown away is in a real sense an eventuality for basically every toy and the premise demands the film investigate that. But taking the opportunity to use a toy problem as a prism through which we see distinctly human struggles is such a marvelous platform for writing and an opportunity that is always seized by the franchise. Using art to open an emotional door for someone is a pursuit that I find quite noble but that doesn't stop the movie just being good to watch. I see a team that put everything they had into it, but also one that knew they made a lot of really interesting choices and were pulling it off. Not for a second does the film doubt itself or give a feeling of trepidation of safety. It feels really high effort. It consistently pulls the story into unexpected directions, with new characters who integrate really well into an already full cast of beloved ones and giving each fabulous moments to shine. A victory lap, but also a slam dunk and a new standard that it did not have to be. Somehow the film being so concerned with time and being of its time makes it ageless in a lot of ways to me. Maybe that's just a way of saying it has a very special place in my heart. If the regular conversations I have with people in my life about Pixar have taught me anything, it's that the incinerator is perhaps the only moment in all of Pixar that's slightly ahead of Up's married life montage in how frequently it's mentioned. Every time Toy Story 3 comes up, that's the scene. Even in Pixar in general, it casts this enormous shadow. And my gosh, like really, what better example is there of the film going to places that nobody was asking it to go? Disney were enjoying prospective scripts about international flights and toy recalls from Circle 7 Animation, and Pixar said instead, hey, how about we have a sequence of the toys slowly running out of options to prevent their own destruction until they need to accept their mortality as a family with dignity. How about that? It's a great moment. The toy's tenacity is well known, so the film does a really thorough job of displaying how hopeless the situation is so that this doesn't feel cheap. Oh no, I've, uh, let's, uh, let's just not try. <laughs> like if there's any option to get out of the situation, they're probably going to take it. The bout they go through before this showing how hard they fought really sells it and is ultimately what seems to change Woody's mind that staying with the rest of the toys is more important than staying with Andy, someone who doesn't really need him anymore. The deus ex machina claw is an interesting bit to chew on for me as well. Obviously you don't want the toys to actually die at the end and have that be the end of the movie, but getting that an emotional point that they're going for here and then still having something of a peaceful resolution is a tough backflip to make. I think Toy Story 3 only gets away with it by a very slim margin. The reasons being that it obviously pays off jokes from both prior movies, as so it's a great moment of this nostalgia just pumped up a crazy amount, and what the actual device of a deus ex machina classically is. In stories, a deus ex machina is often a sudden, convenient solution to an impossible problem, but it literally translates from Greek to mean a god from the machine. So in by being so literal, paying off the claw as some kind of deity, I think it's just tongue-in-cheek enough to feel earned. 
In terms of pure emotion though, for some reason just like Bing Bong Sacrifice, I obviously agree both it and the Incinerator are powerful scenes, but I've always felt a little on the outside in that the Incinerator isn't the most memorable part of this movie to me. Of course I think it's affecting and extremely bold, something I never thought I'd see in an animated film and it's still arresting to consider that they not only pitched but followed through with, but when I think of Toy Story 3, I'm not thinking of the Incinerator. I'm thinking of the final playtime, and of Andy's mum walking into her son's bedroom and catching her breath. In terms of the incinerator's value within the story, I really have to give credit to the Toy Story 3 screenwriter Michael Arndt for illuminating why I don't really consider it the most memorable scene for me. It's puzzled me for a long time. I've always felt a certain way about it, but I finally found my answer. And I give him credit not just for writing a great movie along with everyone else at Pixar, but for actually doing a such a valuable and insightful video lecture of his own right here on YouTube where he goes through the major points of the screenplay of Toy Story 3 and speaks about what he learned as a writer over the various drafts. It's a fabulous watch if you have the time to look at it in regard to story structure. It's linked below. Absolutely go give it a watch. It's worth its weight in gold. I can't believe it's free on the platform. But he highlights that the climax of the film actually isn't the incinerator scene. It's Woody being handed over to Bonnie. The incinerator scene is a great moment of tension and rescue, but the reason I don't find it actually as emotional as a lot of other people, I think it's because it feels more connected to the characters than the actual story that we've been following. Aunt highlights that there are three sets of stakes really at any point of the story's major moments. There's Woody's persistent external conflict about whether he's going to stay with Andy or not. There's the internal larger question of whether Andy actually cares for the toys at all. And the philosophical question of whether the love between a child and a toy is real, given that all toys basically are disposed of eventually by their owners, which is challenged by Lotso's viewpoint. The reason I find the later part of the film more emotional than the incinerator scene is because the incinerator actually doesn't pay off any of those various threads. It's a moment of extreme external conflict about whether the toys will survive, but it doesn't resolve the film's larger questions about Andy's care for the toys or whether toys are actually cared for by children or not. We see the central tension of Toy Story 1, 2, and 3 paid off in the final scenes of 3, where this fear that Woody has of being abandoned or not being with Andy is resolved and he makes peace with it. Early and continual allusions to trash, landfill, etc. pay off as the film continually grapples with the idea of being put aside by someone you love or shifting into a new perspective on their life, taking your hands off the wheel, of no longer being of use the way you're used to being. While Toy Story is a series very well equipped to appeal to all ages, as obviously 3 did by speaking about college age kids at the end of adolescence, the way this real deep theme connects to parentage is very significant. Andy's mum, even while throughout the film, encouraging Andy to move on, start his next journey, get packing, doing the parent things, eventually gives voice to what feels like the central ethos of Toy Story in its entirety. I know. It's just... I wish I could always be with you. It's the spirit and sentiment of the whole franchise captured in a single line. The sadness it contains, the longing, uh, but also the love and the gratitude and the, the nature of temperance. It's an idea that's being continually danced around, not just in the stories, but in the writing and the songs of the movies up until now. When I heard it the first time and every time since, I am struck by its succinctness and inevitability. It's as if the thought of this is powering every moment of these movies right under the surface, but you don't find the words for it until just then. You can get close, it's like right in your peripheral the whole time, trying so many other ways to see if any, any other words are the right fit. You've got a friend in me, I'll have Buzz Lightyear to keep me company for infinity and beyond. When somebody loved me, everything was beautiful. You can stay with us and last forever. Oh, I wish I could always be with you. Underneath it all, it's like Toy Story finally found the words it was trying to say. It's an exhibition I feel in how to find the point within the premise. Toy Story is a series born of the very simple idea of toys being alive. Who knows where you can take that? It's a very relatable premise that can give rise to a lot of great adventures and jokes, a lot of merchandise and fun stories of people of any age finding something in. But it could also be quite lazy. But it never felt content to play it safe within those very flexible boundaries and went almost exclusively in this third entry to places it didn't need to go the heart of the premise. It's a wonderful confluence of all sides of what we're dealing with with movies this big, and one of the films that I think shows Pixar's real heart, at least at the time, as clearly as you could see it. Business sense, commerce, company acquisitions, yeah, 
but from a non-cynical point of view, it's still using the framework to say something hard. I think Toy Story 3 connects with me because it feels like it was made to be entertaining and nails that brief, but Pixar still searched so doggedly for the human truth within the idea, and they didn't rest until they found it. Sometimes you get a story built up to be the theme, but this is a, an example of the opposite, of plucking the exact meaning from inside the premise that was just waiting there. Working within strict limitations of a project can help you find this if you're smart. If you've got a very small box, very clear boundaries, but you imagine and you brainstorm and you work and you need the dough of the idea over and over hard enough, you can always find the heart of it within the story, the real reason it needs telling, and you'll move from a story you have to tell to a story you need to tell. Maybe you won't always be able to package it in a single line of dialogue, because that's just too fucking perfect, but that shouldn't stop you from trying. Whenever I get a brief, I try to work it over until I get to the heart of it all, the real goal that I'm searching for, the actual thing I'm trying to express, the reason it's worth connecting with, and Toy Story is my blueprint for that. To find that I wish I could always be with you, and deal with that from multiple viewpoints with so many characters giving alternative looks and reactions into that beautiful central stem, you get an evergreen flower of a story. Maybe Woody had his eye on the wrong people, maybe Lotso wasn't able to deal with it and manufactured this hollow version of perpetual love while punishing everyone to make this happen, beating everybody down until they agreed. Maybe Buzz had it right all along. Toy Story 3 is smarter than cheap emotion. It's more than its best moments. It's quite simply one of the most impenetrably perfect sequels ever composed because it's so strongly connected to the heart of the premise in as many places as can be, whether that's for entertainment value or for the emotional content. And I can't ever help it. I watch Toy Story 3 with my favorite teddy bear, Nicholas. He was bought for me before I was born. He's kind of my Woody. Uh, I'm not someone who buys a lot of toys or merch today, but I've kept him. These days, and this is definitely a symptom of how I think times have changed and my distance from being a 17 year old, I think, but I would assume that maybe Andy probably came to regret giving these guys away. Maybe looking back on it a while later, he'd have wished he had put these guys in the attic. <laughs> Especially if you ever found out that Bonnie lost Woody. Yeah, it's, it's more about the message than the reality. But I watched this film with my boy Nicholas and nah, I ain't ever given him away. Toy Story 3 is an absolute all-timer and a brilliant piece of filmmaking. It's really heavy emotionally. It's a lot of fun though. It's a lot of fun. And if you've been a little scared of it, as I've heard that some people can be, I would strongly encourage you to give it a go and um, see what you can find. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Pixar Quality. For the number four entry, that means we've only got three movies left to talk about, except for the five ones they made after their 25th year. We're not talking about like anything past Luca, so there's only three movies left. What order are they gonna be in? Subscribe to find out. Hit the like button on this video as well if you enjoyed it, that helps me out. Share it with your friends. Share it with your friends.